Hi, welcome to another edition of Family Matters. I'm Chloe Leary, the Executive Director of the Winston Prouty Center. And I'm really happy to have Margaret Atkinson back here joining <laughs> us. We uh, had talked last time about Wyndham Child Care and Winston Prouty merging and working together. And, um, you know, we've already put our toe in the water. We think it's going well, so <laughs> stay tuned for that. But one, what started to emerge in our conversation that I thought would be worth unpacking a little more um, is why does this matter? So as we were talking about mm -hmm. providers and subsidy and things happening in early childhood and the fact that people who provide early care and learning or child care or you know, some of the language things are business owners and people have to pay for child care and school expenses, it's a third of their income. You know, there are some really significant mm -hmm. issues that impact all of us. Right. I think some people think if it's about child care, and I'm just going to use child care as the short term, um, not, I don't know, I don't love using that term, but as a, I think that that's actually what makes people not like it. It's like, it's their child, their child care. Mm -hmm. If they can't afford child care, why? it's not my business. Why is it their business, so to speak, no pun intended, but, so I think it was worth talking about some of those sure. things, so. What's, uh, well, what thread should we start well, with? Because there's so many. many. And I, so I think you do hit the nail on the head in some ways in that, you know, our culture is about, you know, families are really seen as on their own. You know, the nuclear family is its own little lifeboat out in the storm. And I think, um, per, you know, people like Robert Putnam have written about how maybe 30, 40 years ago, the idea of the well-being of families was a concern of the entire community, mm -hmm. and the idea of the well-being of children was much more of a concern of the entire family. So if you're interested in pulling on that particular thread, uh, Robert Putnam's Our Kids is a great mm -hmm. book to read mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, there are a lot of folks who think that uh, individual families or a group of families' child care uh, problems, their inability to find care or the cost or the quality of it is not their problem. But um, there's a lot of people who work in our economy who have kids as well. And uh, the consistency and the quality and the of, of care for families, you know, if families have that, that means they can go to work and focus on their jobs mm -hmm. and show up every day and be there to be a nurse or be a firefighter or be a administrator. You know, all you, there's a lot of people who have children and still need to work. And our economy does not run if the child care system is not there to mm -hmm. scaffold families mm -hmm. so that they can go out and mm -hmm. go to work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in our region, uh, child care businesses are also a part of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, spend much of their income locally. So folks who are either uh, running centers or running uh, home-based child care businesses, they're paying wages, they're buying supplies, they're buying heating mm -hmm. oil, they're buying food, they're, you know, they're, um, you know, they're businesses like any other, but their, their economic impact uh, is, is greater because they're also mm -hmm. allowing the parents of the children they care for to also go out and work and make an economic impact. Mm -hmm. So there's that sort of dollars and cents things, and then there's the other brain science uh, side which shows that you know the the brain is developing very rapidly from ages mm -hmm. zero to five, so ninety percent of the brain is built by the time a child is entering kindergarten, and so we certainly see that um, the more uh, socially and emotionally ready, the more academically, whatever that means, pre-academic, pre-academic, right. the the more ready a child is for kindergarten, the better they're going right. to do, and the. The care of children who are coming into the public school system not ready because they're not exposed to pre-literacy skills mm -hmm. or they haven't reached a social and emotional level of um, competency, so they don't know how to wait, they don't know how to control their impulses, mm -hmm. you know, all that has an incredible impact on the functionality of a kindergarten, first grade, mm -hmm. second grade classroom. and. Um, you know, that means that more resources have to be spent on, you know, intervention, special education, right. et cetera. And 
that means everybody is going to pay more in taxes. So, so you know, <laughs> we like, just came not to be circle. totally self-interested, but but even if you do not have you know children of your own, you live in a world with children and families, and their well-being is going to affect your That's right. own economic well-being because even though we're connected that we just are. I, and I think that's a great point about, we often are trying to make the argument of like, it's just the right thing to do. These are our little people, We're, we need to invest in them. And in some senses, and we talked last time about, we are making a public investment with the mm -hmm. Act 166 public pre-K. It's this big, but mm -hmm. it's there. So there's sort of, you know, this fight for being the right thing, which is great. And I happen to think it is, but I'm realizing the more there are people out there for whom that self-interest argument will be more compelling or yes. more interesting or resonate, which is okay, mm -hmm. because it's also true. It's not, you know, these are very true things. Right. That. Well, I think, you know, I look at, you know, my own sort of sense of self-interest is that, you know, I really, you know, my family, we moved here 25, 30 years ago. You know, I like it here. I want to grow old here, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I want to grow old in a town that has a viable economy. So mm -hmm. where there's, um, you know, everything that we enjoy, um, you know, services, restaurants, shopping, you know, my own employment, you know, and you can't have a viable economy if there are no jobs or if you skew the populations so much in one direction. I mean, Win uh, Wyndham County is the oldest county in the state. Oh. It, it is. We statistically are the grayest county, huh. which is why, you know. Um, it's because it's the south. Yeah. <laughs> it's so warm down here. But, but the thing is, is, you know, certainly we're in the local economic development arenas. You hear a lot about attracting young families and businesses, you know, looking to grow and attract mm -hmm. employees and that, you know, there there is a, a rising entrepreneurial technical mm -hmm. business community growing and all that is great. But if a young family moves from, uh, you know, Connecticut or Boston to Brattleboro and they have a toddler and a baby and they can't find any place mm -hmm. for their, their kid to go to child care, well, they're not going to be taking that job. Yeah. And it's, you know, so you need to have sort of all, you know, you need to have that in place to actually do that, all that other hard economic mm -hmm. development work. And I think it's been, you know, as you and I have discussed before, it's been a kind of a slog to get there to be a wider recognition that the early care and education sort of system and what's available and its affordability and its quality really does have a broad impact mm -hmm. on the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's certainly not the only thing, but it's a thing that is not getting enough attention. Right. And it's opinion. multifaceted in right. a way that I, you know, talking about the system being complicated and so many variables going into it, I think makes it hard to grasp. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, thinking of which arguments or which point to make that will help somebody understand why it's so important. Um, so, you know, I know our region, like you're pointing out, is looking for young professionals and really sort of has this as part of the economic yeah. development yeah. plan. And um, I think they're, you know, helping sort of broaden that conversation and understand. So when they, um, they the general people interested in economic development might hear about um, wow, we're losing providers in the community because of the new regulations or, you know, they, it's not, if the story's about regulations, they're not going to mm -hmm. catch on to it. But if the story's about, therefore, there will be even less quality <laughs> really care, care available, mm -hmm. that might un help them understand why it matters. Yeah. And you can't just, I think one of the things, and I'd be interested to hear what you think about this. So, in the past, and, and there have even been institutions in the area who uh, are large enough to make their own early mm -hmm. care program. So, um, to some success or not, but you know, if you're a large employer in the area and you want to sort of guarantee care, what, what are the upsides and downsides of that? Well, yeah, and there, there are great historical models. Um, I, I know that the first uh, NACI accredited Child What's care, Na the National people. Association of the Education mm -hmm. of Young, young Children. children. Um, first NACI accredited program in the state was at Marlboro College, uh -huh. and so 
Um, and at that time, I think it was probably in the 70s, you know, the employee base of Marlboro College was young families. <laughs> and, you know, and that was apparently a beautiful, wonderful program yeah. that stayed open for a number of years. But over time, it became less sustainable because, you know, the children grew up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some more and children parents stayed. Yeah, and parents <laughs> stayed in their jobs and mm-hmm. some um, more children from the community were empty. But but again, the expense of running an enterprise like that um, in a rural area is difficult. So mm-hmm. eventually, you know, they made a rational business decision and closed mm-hmm. their program. Mm-hmm. Um, folks in this region talk, look at Badger Bomb over in mm-hmm. um, Gilsom, New Hampshire, I believe. They also have a wonderful program right mm-hmm. now, but they also have a worker base that mm-hmm. is young families. Mm-hmm. So they mm-hmm. have a built-in clientele. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a great program, I, I, and the you know I think it's like remains to be seen what, what the longevity of mm-hmm. that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know there's not necessarily there are large employers here, but having the capacity to open a childcare center adjacent to your business, mm-hmm. I think it's it's a heavy lift mm-hmm. um, expense wise. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there might be some other things that. Uh, employers could do um, there certainly could be they could find a way to subsidize care in existing uh, businesses yep. Yeah. Yep. now I mean there are many both center and home based providers in the community um, if if an employer could offer as an employee benefits uh, you know a bump either a bump in pay mm-hmm. or a child care mm-hmm. subsidy mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. through your um, uh, cafeteria benefits plan right. you know yep. there's some yep. actually there's yep. some mechanisms in place that are very familiar to the business community where mm-hmm. you know it's like oh well someone could you know have pre-tax money put in for child care i mean mm-hmm. our own we do that in our mm-hmm. business mm-hmm. as well um so i think that there's ways that uh employers could with mechanisms that exist now be more intentional about mm-hmm. um offering support to families uh what can be done about just right now the current shortage of care is a little bit more complicated because Mm -hmm. um, one of the structural problems is that uh, it's a a profession that is quite low paid. So it's expensive to open a home-based child care business. Mm -hmm. I think the average income of a of a home-based provider in our region is about twenty-four thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year, which is, you know, for a job that you're pretty much at twelve hours a day, mm-hmm. you know, doing some pretty emotionally mm-hmm. intense work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's not the best. It's not nothing, mm-hmm. but you know, it's there's the structural problem of parents feeling like they pay a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and providers and not being paid quite enough. And that, as you know, with the Blue Ribbon Commission has been really the mm-hmm. crux of the problem. So how do you move the needle on having, being an early educator, an attractive career path mm-hmm. that people choose because they want mm-hmm. to, because they love kids or they love the brain or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, you know, there are definitely folks who said, oh, I would love to be in early education, but it doesn't it doesn't pay and when you have someone coming out even with a associates or a bachelor's degree with mm-hmm. 20 or 30 thousand mm-hmm. dollars in student loans it's really hard so. and that which is another angle actually yeah. of economic development that we didn't really talk about I'm glad you mentioned that uh, in a you know traditional market based economy or model like this you know, we were talking last time about there's no infant care. So you think, but there's a demand. I mean, there are, there are waiting lists. We have mm-hmm. people pregnant on our waiting list. Right. Um, and so you think if there was such a demand, you people would be opening the business. But right. you just point out why they don't. And it's because it's not a, an, enough money. It's actually... Um, you know, some of the provision of the services on the backs of providers mm-hmm. because the wage is not a lot. But we can't just increase how much it costs parents yeah, because, because they, then it's unsustainable yeah. and then they can't. Why well, take the job? It's cheaper for them to stay home. Mm-hmm. So that sort of variable. But, um, you know, there I, I appreciate that there are creative things to do that maybe are not so hard that mm-hmm. are familiar in other businesses and institutions like uh, the cafeteria plan or Loan forgiveness. Right. Which I was just going to say that would be, I think loan forgiveness would be a huge Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know certainly that's a model that's known with um, with K to 12 education. Mm -hmm. um, I think loan forgiveness would be a huge incentive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think finding ways to uh, that businesses could support sort of cooperatively support um, spots in a business so they are, you know, the provider may get an income whether the the, the spot is occupied uh -huh. or not. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of like other sorts buying of buying a slot, and buying a slot in case you have an employee who comes along and needs a yeah, spot. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's. You know, there's lots of different models, and the um, Let's Grow Kids with their Vermont is it Vermont Early Childhood Business Business Council Council. Mm -hmm. I know is start. I know that they've been investigating models of uh, business-based childcare around the state, mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know they're also starting to sort of raise that as an issue uh, around the state, probably getting. Some let's grow kids people on this show to mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. that would be good, but it's mm -hmm. it's useful to see that it's becoming part of a a broader dialogue mm -hmm. because um, you know it it it's always hard to hear about how employers can't find employees and they spend a lot of time recruiting people mm -hmm. and bringing people in, and then you hear definitely in our work with uh, child care referral hearing people's just incredible frustration mm -hmm. at trying to find a spot mm -hmm. that will allow them to go to work. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's really, it's a very difficult time right now, but I also feel like this cycle has gone on for right. years and years and years. I've never, you know, I have not been in this business long enough to, you know, to have that kind of perspective, but I certainly know that, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, just the shortage of spots, you know, 10 mm -hmm. or 15, you know, has always been a mm -hmm. conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And I think, you know, and I just was going back to thinking about um, if a business were to offer their own an employer who didn't, as part of their core business, do early care, you know, it's sort of this whole, it's not only expensive, but it's this whole area of expertise that, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have. But I was just thinking sometimes when we're hiring, the advantage we have is we can figure out how to offer the, an employee because that's care. what we happen to do. Right. <laughs> so we have a little bit of well, an edge. <laughs> and I think, you know, aside from just the straight up child care related issues, I mean, family friendly policies as an employer are also really mm -hmm. important. So, um, you know, one of the things about have, being in the nonprofit sector or the sec I was in the sort of a cooperative business before, um, you know, there was a lot of flexibility around um, the understanding that you were a worker, but you also had other responsibilities mm -hmm. as a member of your family. And so, you know, flexing hours, mm -hmm. um, uh, support for breastfeeding, you know, all these kind right. of things that can actually make parenting and working easier and um, mm -hmm. less stress you know, stressful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also helps, you know, retain employees. And I think, um, you know, it's always, as a manager, it's the worst is to hear that somebody that is a valued employee is leaving. Um, and if they're leaving because they are not being able to meet their child care mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. parental care, mm -hmm. you know, issues, mm -hmm. um, it's hard and it's also expensive. You know, this is, you know, when it gets back to self interested, it's expensive to recruit, it's expensive right. to train people, yep. you lose productivity, mm -hmm. um, and all those things are real. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think again, there's been a, a big uh, push to have to raise awareness of family friendly policies. Uh, I think the family uh, medical leave. Mm -hmm. insurance right. discussion yeah. right. has been great and is a big step forward. But, you know, businesses, um, you know, I get it. It's hard to balance those things, but. Um, right. And I think, right. The, so the argument is often, well, that costs us money as a small business. I can't afford yeah. to offer this sick time or time off or guaranteed time off. But you laid out the argument of, why it actually costs more oh. it might cost more and i get it you know that uh, the size of the business will matter and what kind of costs you can absorb or what doesn't feel like a tangible dollar in your pocket versus how do you quantify productivity right you know i think it's harder for people well, to think, make that leap you know and i think it's true having you know 
been involved in a business, I don't think we ever had the time to do an analysis around what would it, right? <laughs> no, what, no what time would for that. I, what would it cost us to, <laughs> right. you know, offer f more flexible time to our mm -hmm. workers and understand that we're going to lose some productivity mm -hmm. there versus recruiting and retraining, you know, mm -hmm. a new person every six and a half months mm -hmm. because they can't stay on mm -hmm. the job because, you know, and, you know, my sense is that the analysis would come out that it's much more in the churn is much more expensive than than having people have some security to know yeah. that they could call in and say, I really have to deal with my sick child today, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, I have to take grandma to the doctor this afternoon or any mm -hmm. of those family related mm -hmm. caregiving things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I my sense is that the churn is still more mm -hmm. more expensive. But I don't. But small businesses, I get it. Yeah, they don't that's... have having the capacity to think that way. Mm -hmm. I think um, is you know it's a, that's a lift as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, you know, part of it is building a climate of peers that you know huh. that sort of say, well, of course we, of, yeah. you know, of course we offer that, and here's why. I mean, I right. think. Um, you know, change comes from, you know, things being uh, sort of built in, you know, like... Well, right, becoming part of the culture. Part of so the culture, if you're not, yeah. you know, some people are going to be the thought leaders around it, but... It's, and I think it's not only changing the culture and the thinking about it, but helping um, helping each other see how to do it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has done that work up front saying, I know it sounds expensive, but here's really... Here's somebody's me made it work. So... That's an interesting thought, connecting employers, not just around, and I wonder if that early, um, the Early Childhood Business Council is talking about that too, helping them support each other, like peer support. Like peer support. Well, and I think people need to see the dollars and cents and to, yeah. and, and every business is so, um, you know, people talk about the business community as if they're all doing one thing. <laughs> and, you know, I was involved with a business that was the most idiosyncratic, you know, ad hoc kind of joint you know and um i think when you're in nonprofit, you sort of also get used to that as well but you know being actually in a you know a real live for-profit business it was still really idiosyncratic mm -hmm. and 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 uh it didn't fit into sort of the business community and i think most business owners might feel that way it's mm -hmm. like well there may be the business community and then there's me that's right and my thing you right. know right. and so i think it's you know, in thinking about how do you sort of move the needle on, you know, family friendly policies or more support for, you know, early care. It, part of it is, yes, having some mm -hmm. some leaders really lead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's going to take some work on our part to sort of find those people mm -hmm. and, to, you know, uh, get their story and to try some things, you know, um, and I think they're out there. It's just making the connection. I, and I just had a thought, too, about because we were talking uh, earlier about how people pro providing care are business owners as mm -hmm. well. So the partnering can happen in multiple ways, mm -hmm. maybe. I hadn't really thought of that before, that um, I think we've provided support in the early childhood world from other early childhood providers, but that's sort of perpetuating the same problems that maybe we have in running early childhood business. And wouldn't it be interesting to partner providers with small business owners that are for-profit and non-profit, really or they're, they're actually both for-profit and, and sort of share. Yeah. And then and then you might actually end up also like, oh, well, you save a spot. From, I have an employee coming who yeah. needs a spot. Well, what can we do? It would just There's a lot of potential. Yeah, I and think, I, well, I think that it's definitely as the field becomes more professionalized. You know, I think one of the gaps that Wyndham Child Care has been trying to fill over the years is really... Um, working and other agencies do working to offer support around um, the business side of running a child care. Mm -hmm. So, what do you need to know about your own taxes mm -hmm. and and you know benefits and and all those, especially for the home based providers because um, you know being self employed in a home based business is a really sort of specialized. Yeah. Uh, thing and mm -hmm. there's a lot of you know there's a lot of extra detail and I think most of the folks who start out becoming especially home-based <laughs> providers are they I, I sort of said they're a bit it's a lifestyle choice it's a bit more like being a farmer I think mm. most people who 
you know, unless they're, they come from generations of farming, don't start out as farmers because they think they're going to make a lot of money yeah. in a farming business. It's because they have a love for the work that mm -hmm. is um, more encompassing. And I think people go into early childhood not because they think they're going to, you know, make a fortune in the mm -hmm. child care racket. It's because they really love kids <laughs> and they love mm -hmm. working with families. And then that business stuff is kind of like mm -hmm. a burdensome side. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I think that... Um, it has definitely been, you know, a lot of our work in helping folks to run their businesses mm -hmm. better, keep records mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. um, you know, be more organized, you know, understand how much things mm -hmm. cost, mm -hmm. how understand how decisions that they make have an impact on their bottom line. But that's a, you know, it's not skills that come naturally to a lot right. of these folks, and yeah. so it's. You know, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. So maybe partnering with other mm -hmm. business mentors might be great. Yeah. yeah. Maybe with farmers. <laughs> we'll There's certainly lots of good ideas. Yeah, really. Um, and, you know, I think one of the uh, things that you pointed out to me as we've been talking about economic development and as it relates to early care, um, there's a great video. I just want to mention oh, yeah. it, and we'll put up the we'll put up a little snapshot of it. But um, describe the video a so little the, bit. So the video I think was it... made in California, some probably in 2015, and it's called "A Day Without Child Care," and it's really funny. It's sort of done as like a news broadcast where like basically nobody who is involved in child care shows up for work that day, and it's just what happens mm -hmm. when you know, the, when child care is not around and, mm -hmm. and the cascading, because basically mm -hmm. the entire society really breaks down pretty quickly <laughs> because, you know, the, the police, you know, and the fire can't go to work and yeah. the nurses can't go to work and the, you know, the attendant at the old folks home can't go to work and right. the guy at the DMV can't show up. And it's just like, I think it makes people think really broadly and it's, um, it's quite hilarious. Yeah, actually. it is. It's, it's and, funny. But, and I think to the point of, um, why should we all care about this, even this if we don't why. have kids? I think it shows when child care breakdown happens, it does impact everybody. Yep. And it's not, you know, again, whatever your self-interest is or is not, I think it tells a good story in a funny way of, like, this is why yeah. you should care about You're, it. The so. line is longer at the DMV today because... <laughs> Somebody because somebody couldn't come to right. work. So anytime you're right. standing in a long line, <laughs> think it might be because of child care breakdown. And, you know, right. Let's ask people to start thinking about that. Somebody stayed home right. having to take care of their having kids to take instead care of, of going kids. to child care. Yeah, so, yeah. so <laughs> good. So, um, so, yeah, we'll put that up yeah, and cool. um, help um, hopefully continue the conversation with others mm -hmm. in the community as well. So, yeah. great. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for asking it's all the questions. Fun. Yep. <laughs> good.